Good morning and welcome to the January 2024 virtual meetings of the FTP. I'm looking forward to connecting with you over the next three days and to share this exciting program with you. We count on the work of our incredible member volunteers to organize the meetings. So I wanted to recognize the team who does that, led by Barbara Gardner of Tufts University, chair of the program committee, as well as all the committee members. We also owe a special thanks to our program coordinator, Sarah Piechuk, for the invaluable role she has played in helping us to launch and support this meeting. Throughout this first year of my role as executive director of the FDP, my focus has been to connect with our stakeholders and partners, as well as to reach out to our committees and working groups to gain a deeper appreciation of the activities they are involved in. We have also worked to build the infrastructure needed to manage the financial health of the FDP. We just completed our annual audit process, which showed no findings or concerns. This strong financial footing is essential for us to continue to build our capacity to conduct demonstrations, hold meetings, and reach across organizations to support the nation's research enterprise. We have also reviewed our meeting structure and are committed to holding in-person meetings on an annual basis for the next two years. To support that, we will be holding meetings at the Mayflower Hotel this May, May 22nd through the 24th, and again next year in May 2025. We will continue to evaluate the meeting cycle and look for ways to come together both in person and in a vi virtual format. As you know, we just had an election for the administrative co-chair role. Alex Albanek was renewed in her role. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate Alex. I am looking forward to working with her on continuing to implement our current strategic plan and on envision envisioning the phase eight of the FDP. One of the priorities we will focus on is to work towards a review of our committees, priorities, and member engagement through that structure. Another will be to focus on the strategic relationship between FDP and the National Academies through our connection to the government university industry research roundtable ta that are known as GWIR and the Division of Policy and Global Affairs. We, look forward to in, in, we also look forward to integrate the findings of the evaluation process into our strategic outlook. We plan to build on the Communications Committee's wonderful work to upgrade our website and focus our efforts on improving the FTP approach for sharing the results of our work. Finally, we plan to con continue to connect with federal partners, identify focus areas for demonstrations, and find innovative solutions for managing research programs at our institutions. I want to give a special recognition to Tom Arison, who works closely with us on the FDP NASM ties, and to Michael Nestor, who leads GWIR. We count on the National Academy's team to ensure the effective implementation of FTP programs and activities. One of the hallmarks of the, of the FDP is our partnership with federal agencies. We have prioritized federal engagement throughout phase seven and continue to work with agencies on our initiatives. We are very pleased that Michelle Bowles, Deputy Director of the Office of Policy for Extramural Research Administration, OPERA, at NIH, has taken on the role of being FDP's lead, lead to connect with our federal partners. We thank Michelle for her commitment and efforts to coordinate FTP federal engagement. I now turn the conversation over to Alex Alpenick and Michelle Masucci, the FTP co-chairs. Alex is the Associate Vice Provost for Research Administration at Johns Hopkins. Michelle is the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development at the University System of Maryland. I turn it over now to Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. That's a great overview of all the progress we've made in just the past year. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, we have a great program ahead of us and just wanted to take a couple minutes to say hello. Next time we see you in May, um, Maria will have had her one year anniversary as executive director. I can't even describe the impact she's already had. And I think everybody um, would love to just 
provide you with a shout out. Um, go Maria, thank and thanks so much to Sarah as well. We couldn't really have this organization without the two of you, so thank you. And thanks to everybody who took the time and made the effort to vote for me and affirm your confidence in me in continuing for three more years as co-chair of FDP. I appreciate it, and as I said in my vision statement, FDP really is truly poised to do great things. We're working on expanding our federal participation. We're um, streamlining our operations, continue, and, and really working to strongly support our volunteers so that they can do their amazing work um, in implementing our demonstrations. I really look forward to working with everybody um, and, and serve as a facilitator to the hundreds of volunteers who are active with FDP and making our, you know, helping us to achieve our goals. One of our goals early on in phase seven was to implement an evaluation of FDP. The purpose of the evaluation is not is both to assess FDP's programmatic and organizational qualities. It also is for, to, for us to assess and to communicate the impacts that FDP can have or has had on the landscape of research policy and administration. Um, and, and once we can assess that to make sure we're communicating those outcomes to our stakeholders. There's been a survey, many of you received a survey, all the members, um, great response last fall in order to gain some insights um, that will be included in that report. Um, Robert Nobles, thank you so much. He has led this evaluation working group. Thanks to Robert and the whole working group who has um, championed this process from the very beginning of um, phase seven strategic planning. Um, he will actually be providing some uh, preview of some of the findings and where we are on the in this overall process this afternoon at the faculty forum. So everybody's welcome to join and hear. And I'd also like to uh, provide a special shout out to the Center for Evaluation Research from the uh, um, from the University of Mississippi for their continuing work on this evaluation um, under Sarah Mason's leadership, um, who's the director of the center. It's just been pleasure working with them and I'm so excited to hear what what the outcomes are. Speaking of shout outs, I think most of you have seen our new and improved website. Um, you know, our communications committee did incredible work on this. They're just the, the, it was such a heavy lift, but I think everybody would agree when you look at it, it's so beautiful, it's user friendly. Um, I can't even say, you know, I, words don't express the appreciation and the impressiveness that I find that website. And they're working now to expand upon that accomplishment. They're working on designing an FTP newsletter, which I think is gonna be a great tool for outreach and for keeping all of our members, you know, apprised of all the work that's taking place on a daily basis at FTP. Um, and I think it will help us to enhance the reputation of FTP because it'll we'll have more communications and more tools and resources to educate our stakeholders on all the important work that FTP does. And that's primarily, as we know, through our demonstrations. And just as a reminder, we continue to look for and seek out new ideas um, for demonstrations. We want to you know, create the knowledge that allows us to identify best practices for research policy implementation and to make sure that we're, you know, we have a high quality research enterprise, both nationally and within our own institutions. Um, a great example is our active pilot on the, um, the data management and sharing um, plan. So we're piloting, as you know, um, uh, a few templates for plans, progress is, we're making a lot of progress and, you know, a lot of people are participating. And as you probably know, there was just a town hall, I believe earlier this month, I think it was this month or maybe late last month. Um, we're still looking for, if anybody is interested in, in participating in that demonstration, you're welcome. Research security, we're creating different, all sorts of activities and tools. You'll be hearing more about that during this meeting, in fact. So um, stay tuned. And then research compliance tools that are being developed or have been developed. So the CUSP protocol inventory is well on its way. Um, you likely will hear an update during a committee meeting. And then um, we are, are also working on updating the widely used and relied upon FCOI um, audit clearinghouse tool. It's been around for a long time and it's in, in sorely needs a, an update, a technology lift. So we're working on that. You're going to hear a lot more throughout this whole meeting. Um, and then as, as we've been trying to be pretty consistent on our closing session on Wednesday, you will also hear um, 
had the opportunity to listen to some updates from our committees. And um, just a, a word about engagement. You know, FDP relies on um, member engagement. And, you know, we're really focusing on, as Maria had mentioned, um, federal participation as well as enhancing faculty involvement. Michelle Bowles is now our primary federal liaison, and she's championing a lot of efforts. So I think you're going to notice um, the impact in short order. And Michelle and Maria um, are, are will be holding the faculty committee business meeting. I will be joining them. We're going to discuss faculty engagement. There's a lot of opportunity for um, volunteers in the faculty committee to um, you know, step up and, and if they're interested in a, a leadership, a leadership or participation opportunity, um, we're going to make them. Well, primarily Michelle and Maria are going to talk about the different committees, what, what um, opportunities are currently there, and then also take that time to hear firsthand priorities for engagement from the faculty perspective. I think it's important to have both when we're forming um, new committees or or trying to fill vacant positions within existing committees. Um, and Maria mentioned or alluded to uh, our, our deep connection with um, the National Academies. And one of the areas that I think that we can work more closely with the academies is regarding our meetings. So we've agreed, I think everybody knows that, you know, that there's a great benefit for meeting in person. Um, and we do have um, one coming in May and then the following May in 2025. But we're also going to look at other ways to engage in between those meetings off cycle or um, perhaps um, in cycle, but in a hybrid um, synchronous manner. So the um, academies, we would love to hear not only your ideas for other ways to engage um, through meetings, but also any interest you might have in off cycle working meetings, perhaps at the academy, all would be very possible because they have amazing facilities. Um, so keep us posted if you if you have if you're working on a working group or if you have ideas of visiting the academies, we'd love to hear it. So that was a lot. I'm going to stop talking now and pass it over to my co-chair, um, Michelle. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I appreciate that. And um, congratulations on being reelected as the co-chair representing the administrative function of the FDP. Um, I know from a faculty perspective, we're really thrilled that you're going to be continuing in this role and appreciate um, the support that you have for us and just the fact that you're going to come to our business meeting and help us think through our leadership needs um, for the organization. I think it speaks to um, a very uh, I think important and renewed sense of um, a fo focus on the faculty engagement piece. And of course, we all feel very strongly about our federal engagement agenda as well. Um, let me add my welcome to everybody to joining us for our virtual meetings. And just so you're clear, we're not getting rid of the virtual meetings. We're just committing to our in-person meetings in May in the next two years. So we'll be connecting to you um, as often as needed to get our work done. Um, I also want to recognize Maria's fantastic leadership of the organization. I can't believe it's almost been a year. It just doesn't seem like that's possible, but I know how hard you're working for us. And I just think that the organization is thriving under your leadership. So shout out to you as well, Maria. Um, I want to remind everybody that it is not too late to register for the FDP meetings. You can do that in real time. And so if you have colleagues at your institutions or around the country who might like to join us, don't hesitate to let them know that they can do so. I also want to just call your attention to some of the faculty specific um, items on the agenda that you may be uh, not be aware of. We've already covered most of what the program will include, but this afternoon there is a faculty forum which will be held from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern, and we're very pleased that Sheila Garrity will be joining us from the Office of Research Integrity as its director at HHS. Um, we'll also get an update on the evaluation process to date from Robert Nobles, who's heading our uh, research evaluation working group. Um, those of you who have been there before know it's a kind of tradition now that we have this virtual happy hour. So that's scheduled tomorrow at five o'clock Eastern. And this is open to anyone, not just the faculty, but certainly we faculty like to connect with each other and just sort of 
see how things are going at our various institutions. So please don't be shy. Come and join us tomorrow. Bring your beverage of choice. And we know it's a little early to have happy hour on the West Coast. So that's OK. We won't tell anyone. Just come and join us. Um, we have a faculty administrator collaboration team meeting that will be held Wednesday from 11 to 12.15. And this has been an incredibly important um, at venue, I think, for us to think carefully about how the work that we do at FTP gets socialized back at our home institutions and how we can also think about where there are institutional issues that need to be resolved that map on to the administrative challenges we sometimes face um, in implementing our grants. And finally, as Alex alluded, we have the faculty business meeting scheduled for Wednesday from 2.15 to 3.30, and it's kind of gonna be packed um, because the idea here in light of the many leadership transitions that are going to be happening in the FDP over the coming few months, we want to reinvigorate faculty's engagement with those leadership opportunities. So we want to be thinking about where there might be an interest in a new priority in one of our committees, or even where we might have a need for some new committees to be proposed. I know I have some ideas that I'm going to share, but you may have some as well. So please join us for that um, conversation, which we intend to be uh, an iterative conversation so that we can do some agenda setting. Importantly, at that meeting, we will also be talking about our faculty workload survey plans. We're looking to stand up a working group on the workload survey. So for those of you who are interested in being a part of that, please do not hesitate to reach out to me so that we can establish that. We are planning to hold an in-person meeting of the uh, faculty workload survey working group in May, but we'll also be meeting on route to May to plan how we're going to elicit input um, from that group on the new survey design and process. I sent some email out to the faculty specifically about this through the listserv. I know that some of those messages are hitting your junk mail, so please go check your junk as well as your regular email to make sure that you find that message, and I'm happy to follow up individually as, um, as necessary. In addition to those sessions, of course, we recognize faculty engagement across all of the projects and demonstrations that are showcased in this meeting. I just want to thank everyone for their contributions to that. I want to call your attention to the fact that in December of 2023, the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine, through its Policy and Global Affairs Division, held a workshop entitled On Leading a Lab, Strengthening Scientific Leadership in Responsible Research. This was a workshop that was um, organized under the auspices of the Strategic Council for Research Excellence, Integrity and Trust, which is co-chaired by Marcia McNutt and Franz Cordoba. And that workshop um, was uh, designed to explore new approaches to strengthening the integration of scientific integrity and research ethics into the conduct of research, as well as recognizing how our expanding roles through the course of our careers um, and expectations change as one becomes a research leader. We have a, a very large effort to train people in RCR, responsible conduct um, of research, early in the career, but often we find that there's a gap that happens once you get established as a scholar and as an independent PI, um, but are taking on new and very large and expanded roles of responsibility, running labs, running major international collaborations, running research offices, even as many of us do. And yet there is not very much in the way of training and uh, resources to help guide you in, in how you would um, develop your knowledge and understanding of how to do all of that. So this workshop aimed to tackle that question um, and really figure out what resources are needed to help um, established researchers expand their roles as leaders, um, directing labs, departments, or collaborations, and how that role is evolving to meet the needs of a changing societal landscape um, that we all interact with and which will be kind of, a, I've, I believe, a little preview to the, the talk that Calvin will be giving us um, in short order. So we're considering um, how we can connect to that theme here at the FDP. That's one of the reasons why we invited Sheila Garrity to join us in the faculty forum later on today. She was actually a member of the workshop 
Um, and we look forward to your input on this particular issue. So let me use that as a point of departure to introduce um, our very esteemed guest today, Dr. Calvin Drogemeyer. He is a professor of atmospheric science and a special advisor to the Chancellor for Science and Policy at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. For those of you who do not know, his expertise is in satellite and radar remote sensing, thunderstorm dynamics and hazards, and weather and climate risk. Um, in, uh, prior to joining the U of I, he served as the Regents Professor of Meteorology, the Weather News Chair Emer is the Weather News Chair Emeritus, and the Roger and Sherry Teagan Presidential Professor at the University of Oklahoma, where he had been on faculty from 1985 to 2023. He previously served on the, as the University of Oklahoma's Vice President for Research from 2009 to 2018, and founded and served for five years as the director of the Sasaki Institute, which fostered the development and application of knowledge policy and the advanced technology for societal impact. He served as chair of the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities Council on Research Policy and Graduate Education. And he is a fellow of both the American Meteorological Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. You all know him as well for having a very substantial federal presence where he served as um, the federal science and policy leader um, as a member of the National Science Board from 2004 to 2016. Four of those years he spent as vice chair and then he directed the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy from 2019 to 2021, something the research community will be forever grateful for, I can assure you. Um, and concurrent with his leadership at OSTP, he served as acting director of the National Science Foundation for two and a half months in 2020. At the state level, he was appointed to Oklahoma's governors, uh, the Oklahoma Governor's Science and Technology Council from 2011 to 2019, and as cabinet secretary of science and technology from 2017 to 2019. We're very pleased that he is here to talk about his brand new book, called Demystifying the Academic Research Enterprise, Becoming a Successful Scholar in a Complex and Competitive Environment, which is now available through MIT Press. Thank you, Kelvin, so much for being with us here today. Thank you, Michelle, for that very gracious introduction and, and great to, to have all of you uh, here uh, today. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. I love FDP. I've interacted with FDP over the years, uh, back in the days when Susie Sedwick was part of it. and. And uh, you've done some extraordinary things that I reference very heavily in the book, and we'll talk about that. But I uh, really, really do appreciate the opportunity to be here. And thank you for all the great work that all of you do. It's a, it's a very volunteer-centered organization, and it wouldn't be effective without, uh, without everyone's participation. So I really do appreciate that very much. Um, I start out by just kind of thinking about the winding road of, of, uh, of research. Uh, if you're a researcher, uh, you ask a lot of questions uh, along the way. Uh, where does research take place and who funds it and sets the priorities? And, you know, is your own uh, you know, research say, can I, can I influence national policies and priorities? Uh, how is research even used uh, and perceived by the public? Um, if you're a research administrator, you often scratch your head and say, I just can't understand how these researchers think. I don't know what makes them tick. Uh, where do I find funding and how do I obtain funding? Uh, how's my work scrutinized? And I don't have expertise I need. Uh, where do I find it? And, and something very dear to FDP's heart, I see tons of rules and regulations. Help, what do I do? What do I do? Um, bias and integrity and how do I protect my work and who owns my research outcomes? I've done all this stuff and gee, does the university own it? Do I own it? Does the government own it? You know, who owns all this stuff? And maybe down the road, should I start a private company? And it's not so much down the road anymore for people. We've got undergraduate students starting private companies. So there are a lot of questions. And this is just a small sampling of, of the questions. But what's interesting is you go through your education, graduate and undergraduate education. Maybe you have a research position, faculty member, or you're in the research enterprise in a variety of ways. Maybe you're a research administrator, pre-award, pre post-award, research security officer, facility security officer, ethical integrity officer, human subject, whatever it is, um, typically, and you think about starting that point and then, then you retire. <laughs> and so that's the long road. And what's interesting is a lot of the things that I just showed you, you kind of come upon those things as you go through the course of your career. 
Um, you're never really taught them in school. Um, things like intellectual property, unless you have a really good advisor that, and you're working on something like that, you sort of just look it up yourself and you learn it by doing. You don't really figure it out until you need to. And that's not a bad thing necessarily, but suppose we could sort of flip the script here just a little bit and take all of that stuff that you learn over the course of an entire career and you put it on the front end of your career to empower you earlier on in your career to be involved in things that typically take you 15, 20 years of experience to learn. Suppose you got a hold of that and really, really internalize it and were able to use it earlier in your career. That would position you not only to be involved in other things, but maybe be more successful and have a broader view of the research enterprise. And so that's, you, you know, the thing is, you think about researchers and stuff, that's, that's sort of the pathway they walk, but it's not just about researchers. You think about research administrators and the broad context of what that term even means. You know, are we, are we really intentional enough in developing the future of our research administrative workforce? I think a lot of people, and I was vice president for research at almost 10 years at OU and was over pre and post award and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, a lot of people we'd hire, they never really thought about doing research administration. And it's kind of like being a VPR. Sometimes people wake up and it's like, oh gosh, I'm the vice president for research now. What do I do? Uh, what's this job about, you know? So um, I think this, this, this challenge that we I'm talking about here, it's not just for researchers. It's anybody who works in or relates to or has some interaction with the research enterprise, um, the things I'm gonna talk about are very relevant to them. And this is what led me after being in my career almost 40 years and talking about all these things repeatedly to postdocs and grad students or research administrators and early career faculty to say, you know, I keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. Maybe it's time to put this down in some resource that is available to them. So this led me to develop this book for graduate and undergraduate students and postdocs and faculty, but also research administrators and even federal agency program officers, policymakers and staffers. And I've I've had people use this thing and say, gee, you know, we're having a hearing on this particular topic. Can, can you give me some quick explanation of that? I said, well, look at these three pages of the book and there you go, you're good to go. And even the media, I had somebody contact me one time, uh, get, they were involved with the federal budget, the R&D budget for the first time in their career. Woman had a PhD from Berkeley, very, very smart person. But she said, I'm sort of new to this game. I said, okay, here you go. You know, chapter two, sections, blah, 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 explain that information. So as, as Michelle said, this is published by MIT Press, but it's totally open access. So it's completely free. I did not want people to have to pay for a resource that I wanted to see used widely, so it's completely free. It's all disciplines in the academic enterprise. It's not just STEM fields. It's got, and that's why you look at the book cover over here, you see a, a ballerina, you see the music highlighted. It's every discipline, every scholarly area of a comprehensive research university. And all types and sizes of institutions, minority serving, emerging research institutions, and so on. For these institutions that don't have the resources that others do, it provides a lot of guidance as to, okay, what do I, I, I have intellectual property here, but I have no IP office. I don't have an office that, that has, you know, the FTP, uh, uh, you know, guidance for contracts and the, the contract vehicles and stuff. What do I do? Where do I turn? It provides information for them. And it also has a facilitator guide if you want to use this actually as a course or, or as part of a course. It's not a how-to guide, though. It's not the seven magic steps to being successful in academia or writing a grant proposal. It's an educational resource. It's kind of written as a, a kind of a quasi-textbook, as you'll see. But it, I want to provide the benefits to uh, to the next generation and other folks that that I didn't have because this wasn't around when I was there. And it basically tries to take all of that experience with authoritative resources and other experiences and put it in one resource. So every chapter starts with an overview and learning objective. So here's chapter 10. Better safe than sorry, research compliance. Look at the very bottom bullet there. Understand efforts now underway to streamline and reduce the burden associated with unnecessary or ineffective research compliance rules and regulations. Guess where I learned that? <laughs> it was FDP. So, you know, FDP has had only not a profound impact on my own career, but it's it's figured prominently in this in this book. So there are a lot of over uh, the overview of each chapter like that. There's questions at the end of each chapter to assess your comprehension. So I just pulled down some at the end of that chapter and I found out sort of to my, not to my surprise, look at question 29 down there. This is stuff you just go through after you read the chapter. What percentage of time on average is spent by university principal investigators on compliance activities? Again, that's those are the three FTP surveys right in there. They, they're, of course, I talk about them in the book. There's also deep dive exercises. You know, in a book, you can only cover so much. 
So uh, every chapter at the end has these deep dive exercises. And here's the one from chapter 10. Talks about research compliance requirements and so on, and how some of them are ill-suited for application. So you deep dive into these things and go out and look for information. And uh, if you're teaching this as a class or just going through the book on your own, you look at alternative approaches to make recommendations. Okay, how can we streamline? How can we modify? How can we do what FTP is, is working so hard to do and being so effective at? So that's kind of how the book is structured. And uh, for those who have federal grants that require postdoc uh, mentoring plans and grad student mentoring plans, it's a, you, know, you could sort of run your postdoc through the book over the course of a year or something like that. And it would be, a, I think, a very helpful thing for a professional development opportunity. Um, now, you can buy a hard copy. It's free on the MIT Press website. All the PDFs are free. But I did not want uh, anyone to think that I was trying to make money on this. So I, I donated directly from MIT Press all the royalties that I would get to the General Scholarship Fund here at the U of I. So I have no financial stake in this at all. It's just out there for people to use and benefit from. And there's the, uh, the QR code, and I'll make my slides available uh, for all of you. I'll give you a second if you want to scan that, but you don't have to. Just go, you could Google Drogemeyer MIT Press, and you'll find it, and it'll take you to the open access part. You can download each chapter individually. You can download the whole book, the facilitator guide. It's, it's all there. Um, I also, I'm teaching a course in this this semester called Foundations of Academic Research and Creative Activity. I'm really pleased that I've got 10 different disciplines in that course equally split between grad students and undergraduates. What was difficult, though, since I'm in atmospheric sciences, we had to offer it under an ATMS course designation. And so we were shouting from the rooftops with flashing neon lights saying, this is not an atmospheric sciences course. It's for anybody in the research enterprise. Please, please, please take it. There's no prerequisites. You know, look at the book cover. Hopefully it'll convince you that it's for everybody. And, uh, you know, the enrollment isn't huge. It's, uh, it's uh, 18 students. It's a good start, I think, you know. But, uh, but my hope is that other folks will do the same, basically, at other institutions. So I want to just quickly run you through the chapters and then give you a little bit of deeper uh, insight into what the chapters talk about. So the first one is deep in our bones, why and where we even perform research and creative activity, from the very curiosity-driven on one side to the very, very applied, uh, use-inspired on the other side and sort of everything in between. Um, the money trail, funding for research and creative activity. This isn't about necessarily only where you go to find money. It's about how, how does money actually come about? Uh, who sets the priorities? When do the budgets happen? And can I, as a researcher, influence the direction of the priorities and the budgets? So it talks a lot about stuff that I'll show you here in a minute uh, in terms of the process. Perception and reality, public attitudes, understanding, and use of research. We saw this very dramatically in the COVID pandemic, right? Uh, public developed particular attitudes about science. It was the first time they really had a you know, peek under the tent to find out that you don't publish a paper and that's the last word. This paper says, use, you know, use a mask, they're effective. This paper says it's not effective at all. This paper says, well, more work needs to be in the public as their head is spinning like, oh my gosh, what do we do? It's like, well, science doesn't really provide typically immutable answers. It advances one step at a time. And so, but fortunately, um, the, the public, their, their, their support of science wasn't diminished because of that. Um, but how research is used, it gets into a lot of challenges in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, personal, personally held beliefs and things like that of, of how research is used. Performing research and creative activity, this is the essential concept of actually how research is done. Um, testing hypotheses, not only in the laboratory, but in the dance studio, where you actually test hypotheses of human motion and form and things like that. Uh, finding what you need and using it effectively, how you become a detective, whether you create information, create data, do surveys, you know, how, how do you do that? Quality control, quality assurance, all that kind of stuff. There are courses, a chapter on research proposals. We're diving into the pool now. We're going to go for it. <laughs> okay, we've, we've, got, we've got some background information. How are they evaluated? How do we actually manage projects and so on, which, which we heard about just a moment ago. The give and take of criticism. Uh, not just peer and merit review, but scrutiny more broadly. How, how do you deal with it? How do you manage it? How do you process it? How do you respond to it? Very, very important. We see the world differently, bias and differing views. Now, I can't ask for a show of hands, but some of you looked at this picture, probably focused on the left of the picture and you saw a frog. Some of you focused on the right of the picture and you saw a horse's head. <laughs> um, I saw the frog first when I did this. But anyway, the point here is that, that you know, People can look at the same thing and see it differently. So we talk about bias in, in, the, uh, in the text. Ethical conduct and research integrity, super important, obviously. Um, research compliance, 
better safe than sorry. What is it about? What what's it for? What what are the what are the rules of the road in research? Showtime, making your work known uh, to multiple audiences, to expert audiences, to to peers, uh, to to a general audience. How do you do that? Uh, what are the the pitfalls? What are the rules that you should think uh, should think about? Yours, mine, and ours. Ownership of research outcomes. Um, who owns this stuff, and how do I protect it? And what are my rights? Uh, uh, I need you. You need me. All about collaboration, multidisciplinary inquiry, academic corporate partnerships. Uh, of course, a lot of the problems we're dealing with today are at the boundaries of multiple disciplines. And so how does that work? How do I set up a collaborative team? What, what are the things I need to think about? And then finally, a glass half empty or half full, thinking about the challenges going forward and the opportunities in our research enterprise. Um, I like what Harry Truman down below said uh, in the bottom there, pessimist is one who makes difficulties of his opportunities and optimist makes opportunities of um, his or her difficulties. I think that was really, really a good statement. Um, I really like this quote about the book because it encapsulates what I was trying to do. It says, knowledge it took me an entire career to acquire over the whole course of my career, but now is accessible not only as a single resource, but at the front end of a career so that it empowers people to do more than they could otherwise. So I'm going to just walk you through very briefly the content of, of the chapter. There's been a little bit more time on a couple of them that are especially relevant to FTP, and then we definitely want to have time for Q&A. So deep in our bones. Uh, Talk about this, this sort of spectrum from research to creative activity. Um, you know, when I was VPR, uh, I had to really win the trust of the folks in the arts and fine arts and humanities because I'm a physical scientist. So I talk in terms of their scholarship, not in terms of them being researchers because they don't think of themselves as researchers. So you have to find the right terminology, but understanding that's important. Then, of course, the whole spectrum of research. We talk a lot about that uh, from very basic to very applied, uh, you know, where research takes place all the different places uh, that, it, that it occurs and why it occurs there versus some other place. Uh, teams, large centers, uh, the sources of research funds, where, where does the research funding actually come from and how did it evolve to be the way it is? You know, back on the left of that graph in the, the early to mid and late 1950s, it was dominantly the federal government. Now it's just the opposite. Industry is doing a lot, uh, a lot more than the federal government in terms of uh, funding and you know some people say well it's a bad thing some people say it's a good thing i think you need a balance and uh, i think that shows the success of translating federal research outcomes into benefits for society which is what industry does of course curiosity versus use inspired and boundary spanning problems and also this is something i think that the emerging scholars need to understand is how universities uh how they actually support scholarly work and of course so in the book i talk about the structure of academic institutions and then down toward the bottom, the vice chancellor, the vice president for research, the senior research officer, uh, which a, a minority serving institution might be an associate vice president, might be an, a dean or associate dean. So, it, you know, it, it's not always called the same thing at different types of institutions. Most of those positions are well understood by faculty, but the VPR position typically is a little confusing because different institutions deploy it very differently. And it varies a great deal across institutions. So if you look at the broad roles of the vice president, the vice chancellor of research, it's all the things you see here. And the reason I talk about this so much in the book is because a lot of times folks early in their career don't interact with this office, with this organization, including students. And there's opportunities for them to do so, but they simply don't know about it. And, and we're not the best in terms of research uh, senior officers to reach out to those, those groups. It might be the dean of the graduate college or maybe an individual advisor. And so the tissue, the connective tissue is not very strong. But but obviously v, VPRs and VCRs do a lot uh, of different things. And uh, uh, they're responding oftentimes to what faculty need. Now, we faculty are pretty needy people. <laughs> we need and we want a lot of stuff. And so the vice president, the vice chancellor of research has to think about all these different things. And so when I was thinking about all this, I undertook an exercise that I wanted to do for a long time, but I, I didn't do until recently. And I did it partly because I found out that I, I'm consulting for NSF. I'm, I'm actually doing a paid consult for NSF. And uh, I found out that a lot of folks uh, at federal agencies don't tend to have a, a, a deeper understanding of what happens behind the scenes when you submit a grant proposal at your institution and then the funding happens. They, they see it more from the PI point of view, but it's a fairly narrow perspective. So uh, I did this thing, it's a little bit crazy, you'll see here, but in blue, why don't I show you a researcher activity? So the first thing on the left is 
the drivers that influence how researchers think and some of the needs they have. That's the previous slide. And then some of the things like incentives and rewards and professional organizations and priorities of federal agencies, that drives researcher thinking. And then they, they create ideas from that. They, they get, they ideate, they develop ideas. And then agency activities in purple sort of come in here. Like for example, there might be a solicitation. Maybe you're talking to agency staff, program officers and so on. And then the researcher adds their own knowledge, previous work they've done, their own interests, you know, maybe opportunities that are out there. And all of a sudden they have an idea for a grant proposal. And so they develop that idea and ultimately turn it into a proposal that gets submitted. Now, that's a pretty, pretty straightforward process. That's kind of the lens that a lot of researchers will, will look through. But if you start to add in all the university research services and activities that support this, this is, I think, hopefully will be interest, uh, of interest to FDP. For example, research development that, that looks at people's career goals, helps them put proposals in the context of where are you going? Uh, what are the broader impacts of your activity? Thinking about you know, knowledge generation and sharing and, and, and pre-submission rules and roles and things like that. And then of course there's pre-award proposal services and institutional support. Hey, I need matching support. I need, I need this and that. Um, then you've got technology commercialization and corporate relations that come in because if you're submitting a proposal that has potential for technology development, you want to let your tech office know that. And also corporate relations, if you're going to interact with a private company or maybe there's funding opportunities there, great. And of course, there's institutional compliance, export controls, research security, human subjects, you name it, it's all over the place. If the proposal declined, then it goes back, you know, kind of revise it potentially. And if it's funded, then you negotiate the budget. Now you get into post-award financial services. And if you get funding from the institution, oh my gosh, a whole bunch of other stuff now comes into play. Uh, post-award financial services, compliance, all this kind of thing. And uh, then ultimately researchers do their thing. They purchase equipment, they hire students or whatever. And then in red is the outcomes. They publish papers, they create new knowledge and so on. The reason I did this was to show people, especially faculty, but other folks, all the different dimensions of support that come into play <clears throat> when faculty, <clears throat> pardon me, or other researchers, <clears throat> pardon me, um, actually even just submit a proposal, develop a proposal. And so FTP is all over the place in here, right? It's everything you see in green, and then a lot of stuff even you see in purple at the agency, uh, in the agency. So anyway, uh, a fun exercise. It's pretty simple-minded, probably not entirely correct or complete, but something I thought was kind of fun. And, and I think as I shown it to folks, they sort of said, oh, I didn't realize there was all this stuff that went on. Um, <clears throat> okay, chapter two, the money trail. Uh, talking in the book about uh, the agencies or the different segments, seg sectors of, of the research enterprise that fund different types of research, uh, private foundations, of course, as well. And, uh, you know, again, talking a lot about not just the STEM fields, but all these other organizations that fund it talking about uh, how different disciplines have different amounts of funding with, with uh, biomedical research being very, very high uh, and how research budgets are determined. And I do a deep dive on this because I really want folks to understand uh, a lot of the, the pressures that exist at the federal level on the budget. So I go into the R&D planning and the federal budget in some degree of, of detail here. And so basically talking about how things have changed because if you look historically after World War II, you know, it spurred a lot of basic uh, and applied research in the Manhattan Project. That's really kind of how the, the you know, today's agencies, uh, NIH is much older than NSF, but came into existence. And of course, academics left their institutions at Chicago and, and Stanford and, and Caltech and places like that. And they went to work in these, these areas uh, where the, uh, the Manhattan Project was taking place. So um, after the, the war, uh, now all of a sudden, you know, the Allied victory is like, wow, these folks are pretty cool. They, uh, they were incredibly valuable to, uh, to winning the war. And so uh, we ought to do something to support them. Now, prior to that, uh, academic R&D was funded mostly by tu uh, tuition and philanthropy. But, but after the war, the government got into the funding game. But a lot of institutions were very wary of this because they said, well, if the, if the government starts funding us, then they're going to be controlling what we do. Uh, well, that sort of happened, but it, 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 it ended up in a good spot, I think. And of course, NSF was founded with Vannevar Bush's uh, uh, treaties, Science the Endless Frontier. And uh, of course, uh, funding to academia grew dramatically over time. Uh, in the golden age of the uh, the 80s, it grew dramatically and, and it still continues to grow, but we are challenged, of course. And I talk in the book about, uh, you know, this this growth and 
different dollars, constant dollars, co current dollars, things like that. But I, I really deep dive on this chart from AAAS to talk about the so-called entitlement programs, which are we're entitled to receive because they're they're in law. Um, there's other mandatory programs like tax credits and benefits and SNAP program and so on, the net interest on the debt, and then uh, the defense budget. And then over here, what we really care about in the research space is the non-defense discretionary and the non-defense R&D budget together. And so I, I really kind of a deep dive on that to say, you know, that's really where the bulk of the funding that we in academia think about and, 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 and utilize, uh, that's where it comes from. And the fact that the uh, defense and non-defense uh, discretionary sort of uh, track one another pretty closely here. And uh, if you look at how that, that non-defense spending breaks out, here's all the stuff that's in there, but the research part's about, the science part and research is about 11%, 10, 11%. Um, and so of course, healthcare and health research is over there with the 12% as well. So I just want folks to understand how this all works. Now, I, I was unable to find a really decent graph that showed the federal budget process. So I, I created one here that's a little simple-minded, but it tries to basically show left to right some of the key steps of the process that I think scholars in the early part of their career need to understand. And so the actual process is much more detailed, but I think it, you know, this is sort of like would be off-putting, I think, to a lot of folks early in their career. So I did this more simple version. I, you, you just can basically put numbers with it. This, this variable X is just simply whatever year you're interested in. So over here, we're looking right now. We're in January of 20 uh, of calendar year 24, and the budget there in calendar 24 actually started. The agency started planning for that back in in March and April of 22. And a lot of times, I think folks don't realize how long it takes to to get the budget into place. And it plays out over the calendar years and the fiscal years over here. And so I kind of go through that and talk about the agency's plan. Of course, uh, how how uh, priorities are determined. Agencies all have strategic plans. Uh, and they have advisory bodies that have, you know, external representation on them. The White House has a lot to say about it, of course. And agencies fund workshops, too. And that oftentimes will give rise to new topics that uh, the agencies fund. And, of course, researchers can also meet with members of Congress to suggest their own priorities and so on. So you go back and look and say, okay, well, that's kind of the first step. And then the OMB OSDP guidance memo comes out. Well, what the heck is that? Most people have never heard of this thing. So I talk about it in the uh, in the book, and one of the deep dive exercises is for people to go out and find the last 15 or so, which I actually have on a website for them to access, and then look at how the priorities change over time and how they change across administration boundaries. And that's a way for them to learn about, okay, how are these priorities set by, by the Office of Science Technology Policy in the White House? Then the president releases uh, uh, the budget, and of course, it's a, it's a very, very broad uh, budget. Uh, with some detail in it, but it provides a broad strokes. Um, it's, it's you know, it never sees the light of day typically because it's never on the same page with Congress. But the point is, how do, how do uh, individual researchers and academic societies and professional societies advocate for this budget? And they do that, right? Uh, and, and you see all the different kinds of organizations, they write letters and so on. And then of course, individuals can meet with uh, folks on the Hill. And uh, here's just an example, of AAU and APLU, just to show Folks, uh, you know, and this is from my class, you know, how this actually works. Uh, and it's not just these organizations, but it's also individuals. Then, of course, uh, we have all the congressional hearings and the budget resolution that talks about that in the book, Congress having the power of the purse. I just want folks to understand some, some detail of that, especially authorization and appropriation. And the fact that appropriators are the ones who have the, the power, really, uh, and they're called cardinals, of course, in Congress. And so I, I talk a little bit about that and give examples of and how, for example, uh, these agencies are authorized by House Science, and then there's the uh, House uh, CJS Committee is the Appropriations Committee, and the Senate has its counterparts. And so by, by talking about these things, which some people could find awfully dry, I try to spice it up in the, in the book a little bit by giving some contemporary examples and through the deep dive exercises and saying, hey, if you're reading the book right now, go look at the website. We just had, a, the, what, the third CR taking us to March. So you can see what's happening right now in the context of what's in the book. And then, of course, Congress passing a CR. Uh, and it talks about how long it's been since Congress actually passed 12 appropriation bills. It's pretty rare. And so it's been a long time. It used to happen more frequently than it does now. 
Uh, and then, of course, the earmark. I talk a lot about the earmark and what directed spending is and what it means. People hear a lot about it. They don't really know what it means. And, and in my class, I ask people about this, and they've heard the term, but most people have no idea what it means. So um, I also talk about finding money, uh, you know, giving some practical experience of how you can sign up on federal agencies, visit websites. You can go to grants.gov. You can look for BAAs. You can, you know, put in your keywords and you get all this information. There's no lack of ability to, to get information like this these days. And of course, private foundations also sometimes issue calls for proposals uh, under very specific areas and very specific priorities. So I want them to not just think of federal agencies, but also private companies. They're not, they're not funding organizations, so they don't issue calls for proposals. And you have to build a relationship with them. And then we talk about that in chapter 13. So Chapter three, perception and reality. Uh, we talk about the social compact with taxpayers that we are, uh, and this is where compliance comes in, of course, that uh, in exchange for the taxpayer dollars that fund the agencies, uh, there is required ethical behavior, responsible conduct of research and so on. Um, and talk about how the funding for uh, research has, has changed over time and how it goes kind of inverse, inverse proportion with state appropriations <clears throat> to universities in particular, public attitudes, uh, show this graph that shows the scientific community is right next to the military in terms of public support. Uh, Congress is still a bottom feeder there, maybe not surprisingly, and this has not really changed appreciably in the pandemic, so that's really good news. Uh, belief systems and ethics, uh, very important we talk about that. Use of misuse of results in policy, uh, you know, sort of spinning the results or, uh, you know, taking them out of context, and, and how does that happen, and what are the, what are the, the, uh, the outcomes of that? And then roles of research and creative activity in society. Talk a little bit about um, the uh, the technology commercialization process and how research flows from, you know, the the fundamental research to the commercialization and scale up. This is the the, the kind of the old old school school linear model uh, where you know fundamental research begets applied begets development. And that's really not how the real world works. It's much more complicated with reentrant areas and things like that. So I, I talk about that that first model is not flawed, but it's just it's not really uh, depicting what really happens these days. I also talk a little about the arts and the creative side. You know, why do we make paintings of things that we can take pictures of? And I talk about the creative intent of the artist and how how it preserves culture and, and it gives greater depth of meaning and intent versus just taking a photograph. Not that photographs don't do that, but paintings do it in different ways. So some of the essential concepts, the, the general framework for research. Again, I'm not going through this in any detail. I'm just kind of giving you a flavor for this in terms of qualitative frameworks, quantitative and mixed frameworks for research and uh, how they really uh, work, how they're designed and structured. The social behavioral science is quite different oftentimes from the physical sciences, from inductive to deductive approaches. The scientific, whoops, sorry, the scientific method, the general method, indigenous methods, historical methods, citizen science, all the different ways uh, approaches in which we do research, uh, like citizen science, for example, and then, uh, of course, research and education, uh, which is very, very important, the interlinking between those two, because they're very, very tightly coupled together. Uh, and then, of course, serendipity in research. Some things happen by chance, and uh, the discovery of penicillin, for example. So uh, talk a little bit about that. And when do you chase something you think might be a total dead end, but but if, if, it, if it works, wow, it's going to be transformative. And then, of course, Reproducibility, very, very important. Uh, finding what you need, sources of data and information. Do I go out and collect data, for example, with a radar? Do I do, uh, uh, do, I do interviews? Do I, do I collect data in a classroom through clinical trials, whatever? Primary and secondary sources, quality control and quality assurance, which are a lot of times really confuses people. So really try to, to make that clear. And of course, synthesizing information. Uh, how do we bring it together? Different disciplines call it different things, but Bringing together information is very, very important. Diving into the pool, um, components of grant proposals, talk a lot about this, the various dimensions of a grant proposal. Uh, some of the deep dive exercises have, have the reader go through the process of actually developing at least an out, maybe to start with an outline of a grant proposal and then putting meat on the bone and so on or working with their advisor on a grant proposal. Um, talks about uh, the different uh, uh, dimensions of a budget, for example. Some of the, the sort of the, the art of writing competitive proposal and sharing the cost of research, research cost sharing, talk about that a lot and do a deep dive in F&A because it's so confusing to a lot of people. And, and so really do a deep dive on that to make sure that everyone understands what it's about. Uh, evaluation processes, I talk about merit review a lot. 
give some examples from federal agencies and foundations, uh, NIH and NSF and NEA, to give them uh, comparative examples uh, and show that as well. So a lot of that is, okay, how do I, what's the merit review process, but then how do I use the, the outcomes of merit review? Uh, the give and take of criticism, uh, obviously this is very important. It, it's now specifically about peer and merit review, not just in the context of proposals, but, but journal articles and other things like performances and exhibits and so on. Some of the principles of peer review, we talk about each of those principles and how they relate to the definition of peer review and a lot of examples. This is from NSF. Um, this is a peer review example from a generic journal. I just made this up. Uh, it's just a generic process. All journals are different, but you know, if you squint your eyes, they kind of all look like that. Strengths and weaknesses uh, of peer review, and then uh, go through that. You know, sorry, I'm going through this quickly. I know, but there are a lot of lot of known strengths, but a lot of, of known weaknesses uh, of peer review. And these are I cite literature in talking about all this. It isn't just my my ideas. There's there's authoritative literature cited. And then, of course, alternative models to peer review, so folks can uh, can look at these things. And some of them are tested experimentally, and so on. And how do I use a professional critique? How do I actually utilize that effectively? Um, bias and differing views. Uh, talk about what bias really is. It's not clear to a lot of people what bias is, and how it, how it varies from discrimination. Bias and discrimination are very very different, um, and it can determine behavior. And that's when we actually become aware of bias. All kinds of types of bias that I speak to in the book that are really relevant to the research enterprise. Um, it's a fairly comprehensive overview, but but you know you can't go through everything. So again, I give a lot of references for folks who want to do a deeper dive, and there are exercises to do that. Um, how it shows up in our work, um, a lot of the work being done, we still don't completely understand it, and uh, how views of research obviously differ. Uh, and this is true in academia. For example, people who publish, say, in a business school have a very different, uh, you know, sort of tenure model than somebody that publishes in the in the natural and physical sciences. So the views of research and publication stuff differ pretty dramatically. And of course, we saw that in the pandemic, and I talk about that, and I talk about the Golden Fleece Awards and federal fumbles and so on, where uh, there are sort of uh, misguided criticisms about research, but some of them are are true. And so we have to own up to that. And I talk about having a broad view and taking a broad perspective. Honesty is about policy, of course, ethical conduct. We've talked a lot about that in the book, and the trust, standards of behavior, accountability, and how this relates to the um, to the public support that we we enjoy through the social compact with taxpayers, and uh, how, in terms of of research, we want to be free from political influence, uh, things like that. Talk about tenure, and I really, really focus on the the importance of values. When I was at the White House, I talked a lot about this. I still do. Because we don't message this enough in the academic research center when the research enterprise broadly, the fact that it's about integrity and objectivity and openness and transparency and accountability. And so when you think about international collaboration, folks coming to America from other uh, other nations who maybe those folks didn't kind of grow up in the environment of values that we have, it's up to us to to uh, model those values, to teach them those values, to show the importance of those values and talk about them and talk about what uh, happens if you if you don't follow those values and very negative consequences that can happen. So ethics and morality and research misconduct to talk about that as well. And how do I actually develop and maintain an ethical program of scholarship? Um, I'm doing a lot of work with NSF as a, as a consultant on research security. And again, the values are at the core of that. And uh, ethics and rigor and so on are around that. And of course, that sort of defines what research integrity is. And then research security basically is is the mechanism of protecting the research integrity that is so important to the conduct of research. So at NSF, we like to say we want this to be sort of as open as possible and as secure as necessary. We don't want to overreach. We don't want to tie our own hands because if we do that, those nations who are trying to um, uh, inappropriately influence our research enterprise sort of already win because we overreact and we create administrative workload on ourselves. It's really has no practical value. And that's, I know, something very dear to uh, near and dear to FDP's heart. Um, you'll see these graphs in the book a lot, uh, Better Safe Than Sorry Research Compliance. Um, I talk about this a lot in, in the context of the universe of research compliance and knowing the rules and how to follow them. And, you know, this could be a really, really, really dry chapter, right? I mean, really, oh God, research compliance. But I try to make it interesting by, by relating it back to the fundamental tenets of conduct of research itself. And so talking about how the sort of the universal research compliance is all of the things you see here 
And if you relate it back to investigators, the language that they speak and how they work, instead of saying, you've got to comply, we say, if you comply with research, which goes to the fundamental values of the scholarship you're doing, you live by those values, right? Oh, of course I live by those values. Then it, it becomes important to upholding the values that allows them to do the research they want to be doing in the first place. So it kind of is a different way of messaging, I think, the issue of compliance in a way that the research will, researchers will understand and not push back against. And of course, everybody understands the importance of compliance. The question is the research administrative workload that FDP has, uh, has identified over three cycles of its surveys, uh, 42 to 44% is, is just uh, extraordinarily large. Making your work known to multiple audiences, of course, um, uh, how do you do that? You know, communicating with expert and non-expert audiences and how, how to do that's very, very important. I talk a lot about public access, open access, open science, open scholarship, um, and what that means. And the open, ac open publishing models the open access models, various different flavors, the green access, gold, and so on. Uh, so folks understand that, understand you know why they exist and uh, what the you know what the uh, the rules of the road are for that, and why you should think about doing it, and why maybe you shouldn't do it. Um, the ownership of outcomes, kind of a similar sort of thing, is obviously extremely important. In fact, uh, um, I, I had the dean of fine arts at OU tell me one time that a lot of unscrupulous agents will take great advantage of. Of folks in the arts, if they develop scores of music, or if they develop, you know, a, a play or something like that, or whatever, um, they assume they're not going to know anything about intellectual property, and so they basically come and just, uh, 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 you know, basically take it out of their hands, and that's really unfortunate. So um, the point here is to learn about this sort of thing uh, up front, and so I talk a lot about what IP is, uh, what it's not, uh, what can be protected, and then the processes for actually protecting it. Again, relating back to people where they work and live, not just some dry reading about rules or, or, and regulations in patent law or anything like that. Um, then as we round it out here and finish up, uh, boundary spanning problems. Uh, these are typically very distinct disciplines uh, that most of the, not most, but a lot of the problems we're, we're dealing with today that are quite interesting, I'm gonna show you one here in a second, involve these disciplines coming together. And how that happens a lot of times uh, is, is confusing to people. So we think of unidisciplinary, where each discipline sort of stands on its own. You have multidisciplinary, where the disciplines come together and simply interact. You have interdisciplinary, where the disciplines are now not only interacting, but they're sharing uh, you know, mechanisms and things like that. And then you have transdisciplinary, where the disciplines come together to actually create a whole new framework built upon all of the disciplines or most of the disciplines put together. So we try to clarify this in the context of, of folks and how they work and the different disciplines they deal with and, uh, and show here how uh, over time, this is a graph of showing a percentage of published articles uh, involving more than one individual. This is just one mechanism, of course, of, of measuring this, how it's gone up dramatically. It's no longer the single author paper. It's just pretty much a multi-author. And it gets kind of crazy over here. You look at these papers here are the number of papers that are published with one, two, three, four, five, six to 10 authors, and more than a thousand authors, holy cow. Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting when you look at this, but clearly there's a trend of, of scholarly work uh, being published with, with multiple authors in many cases, and certainly international as, as well. And so I kind of talk about why we collaborate and partner. At the end of the day, and I, I did this when I was at the White House, it's because somebody else brings something to the table that we don't have. It might be ideas, it might be perspective, might be their professional capabilities, might be technology, it might be their prestige, hopefully not just prestige, that's not a good reason alone, um, but it expands our opportunity space. And a lot of times when I talk to faculty, they don't really understand that. I say, well, okay, you're working in this particular area. Um, you know, I see other areas that could interact and uh, they're like, well, how do I even find those people? Well, that, that's the challenge, right? It can, we can tackle problems beyond our own expertise and even create new disciplines like like bioengineering um, and so on. Um, but the challenge is, of course, finding people. But you not only want to look for similarities, you want to look for constructive differences. And there's actually some neat uh, capabilities that some, some companies offer to do this, where they say, you know, I, this person in musical theater would never talk to this person in electrical engineering, but they're using fundamentally the same approaches to their problem. And so it, it identifies these differences that are actually similarities disguised as differences. And so how do we get them interested in your problem? How do you develop ways of communicating with them? You use very different language and so on. And of course, 
Incentives and rewards, as I mentioned earlier, differ a lot across disciplines in terms of publication, in terms of credit, things like that. But uh, these, these, there are different models out there. But if you can, can sort of work in this area and do these collaborations, they're very, very rewarding. Um, promotion and tenure, of course, is something that I think we're, it's, it's not a solved problem, but we're a whole lot better at it than we used to be. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, ask you what this, if we were in, live in person, what, what, is, what does this picture show? Well, you see, first of all, a dark sky up here. That's true. There's tornadic storms to the north. This is an aerial shot of, a, of an interstate highway, which is supposed to be two lanes each way. But right now, what you see is it's four lanes headed to the lower part of the picture, which is south. And what happened here this evening, uh, back in uh, 20, uh, was it 2013, I think it was, um, 10 days before this, there was a major tornado hit Oklahoma City, massive tornado, did a lot of damage and stuff. Then 10 days later on Memorial Day weekend of this year, I think it was 2013, another tornado with very similar characteristics was bearing down in the city. And basically folks were told, uh, mistakenly so unfortunately, if you, um, if, you're, if you stay in your home, you're probably gonna die. So everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people get in their cars and they flee to the South. And there's sort of this panic because a four lane highway, or excuse me, two lane and two lane uh, north south turned into a four lane southbound highway. The public did that. <laughs> the law enforcement didn't do it. People just did it by driving the wrong way to escape the threat the wrong way on an interstate. Um, what's the significance of that? Well, you look at this picture. I'm going into my discipline just for a second now. This is the uh, um, 1953, 519 people died in tornadoes that year. And you see the tornado tracks here. And here's the technology we had at that time. Those of you who are maybe a little bit younger, that thing in the upper left uh, center is a phone. It's a telephone. Um, the lower left is a television. <laughs> That's what we had. We had no national radar network or anything like that. That was 1953, 519 people died. Now look at 2011. There were 550 people died that year. And here's the technology we have. Now, granted, there were the population was much bigger, OK? But the technology was dramatically advanced. So you ask yourself, well, what, what's going on there? Why did we see so many deaths? And the answer to that is that back in this day, we were thinking of this as a meteorological problem. Today, we think of it as an integrative meteorological, social sciences, behavioral sciences, anthropology problem, a technology problem, but also a human behavior problem. Because at the end of the day, you're dealing with human beings here who make decisions to do things in certain ways that you think probably aren't the best way to do it. And so only, how, how can we keep people from dying? The only way to do that is to study this problem in its totality, which is a very interdisciplinary, very transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary way to keep people from dying in tornadoes. And we, we sort of woke up to this about 10 years ago. And uh, now this, this is being done in a very integrative way. So I kind of think of a collaborative framework like this is sort of the rays of light coming into a lens. This PP means per project participant. You think of a project, you got one person, one person, two person, 10, might have a large number of people. The lens is the project that focuses them on the project goal here. So they all say, okay, I see the goal. I'm, I'm an MD Anderson scientist in imaging. I'm an MD Anderson scientist in biochemistry. I'm an MD Anderson scientist in clinical care. But what is our goal? Cure cancer, boom. That's the single goal. So as this lens focuses the rays toward the goal, the individual person's contributions go toward that goal, but their career path advances. So their career goals advance at the same time they're working on a project. This is really key to collaboration because a lot of times people think, well, if I collaborate, I'm not going to get credit or my, my career is going to sort of founder. It's like, no, no, no. If you do it the right way, your career advances in a very dramatic way at the same time you're you're sort of helping uh, move toward a, a very large project goal. So that's kind of how I, th I think of that. Then finally, the book ends with a glass half empty or full. And, you know, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities, funding, global leadership, support for arts and humanities, promoting scholarly values and principles and things like educational attainment, student capabilities on the global stage. Are we producing, you know, students that are ready to go to college and so on? diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, um, accessibility, things like that. And then, of course, balancing a security with an open scholarly enterprise, very, very important. A lot of opportunities, right? Uh, very, very important problems out there that 
are ripe for the picking. And so we're, we're, we have greater capabilities now than ever before in terms of all the tools available to us to address some of these huge challenges. And you know, how can we join sectors together to work together more effectively and reducing the administrative workload? You know, when I was at the White House in the middle of COVID, we did a proof of concept. We got a, we got a vaccine in 11 months. How do we do that? We didn't, we didn't circumvent the rules and regulations. We didn't compromise safety or integrity or openness or accountability. We didn't do any of that. We basically said, you know, that report can wait. Oh, this thing, you know, that's not important right now. And this is what FTP has been, been preaching for a long, long time. We did a use case in the middle of a, a global crisis. And the question is, can we do that now because we have that proof of concept, we've done the existence theorem, it's been shown, can we, can we do that? I, I really think we can. But I think the biggest opportunity, honestly, is for those who are the next generation scholars to, to come forward and hopefully this, this book will help them uh, be, be more successful earlier in their career, it will empower them to do things they couldn't otherwise do. And so I just want to uh, tell you a couple of quick things here at the end. Um, there's a chat assistant that was just now customized for the topics in the book. And I came upon this just last week. So our Center here for Artificial Intelligence Innovation created this chat capability, and it's been trained using not only all of the materials in the book, the book itself, all the PDFs, but about 40 different websites that I gave it, including FDP and NIH and grants.gov and research.gov and all the whole tons and tons of websites. And uh, so you can type in a question and it will return an answer. And there's the, uh, the link. Um, if you just, you know, go to the link, you'll see it, but I'm going to and I'll give you the slides again. Let me just show you. Um, oh, there's a QR code. Let me leave that up for just a second because I'm almost done. We'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. But it, it's pretty fun. Now, I want to say that this morning, they're, they're changing and vastly improving the, the back end of the, uh, of the engine. So um, what I'm going to show you here will look differently if you type it in this afternoon, probably. Um, but let me just show you a screenshot. I typed in, how can research administrative workload on faculty be reduced? And here's what it came back with. And what's cool is, of course, it mentions FDP. Now, what's neat about it, it gives the references in the book. And you click on this, it'll take you to the part of the book where this, is, this text appears. But what was not working quite right, I thought, was, well, how about all the other stuff I put in there? So I talked to the people here at the university. I said, oh, there was, there was a problem. The system wasn't working right. So they're now you know, redoing the whole back end and putting in a new system. And it's, they're doing that today. So if you type this in and a lot of other stuff now, you ought to get a different answer that would be much more complete than this one is. But this is specifically for the content in the book and I'm using it in my class as well. So let me just finish with this. Um, in the afterword of the book, I, I talk about research and creative activity and how they accomplish three important things. We saw this in the pandemic. They inspire us a lot. Research inspires. The, the, the first picture of a black hole shadow was very inspiring. They unite us around the common goal to solve problems like developing a vaccine. They also guide us. Research guided us to develop a vaccine and a lot of the other therapeutics, basic research that was done 20 or 30 years ago on, on fundamental work in RNA and DNA and sequencing. And, and now how about distance learning? Well, that work didn't just happen. That happened a long time ago. So a lot of that, that good work that was done, we benefited from. So I personally think that, that sort of the scholarly enterprise is one of the last systems we have in society where those values that I talked about are cherished and modeled and they're preserved. And, uh, and I think that we in the research enterprise have to sort of remain the North Star for humanity, how we can work together, how we can bait vigorously, how we can sort of just go after it and then go out and have a beer together. That doesn't exist. I don't see it in Congress. I don't see it in companies. I, I think the research enterprise, because it's foundational to the conduct of research itself. You can't do research if you don't bring people together with diverse ideas, if you don't respect people, if you're not open. Research doesn't happen. You can't do research without that. So I think it's important to talk about this, but also to model it. We do it all the time, but let's make sure that it's noticed. I think that's extremely important. So I want to thank you all in FDP for the tremendous work that you all do. It doesn't go unnoticed. It's highlighted a lot throughout the book. And uh, I look forward to working with you uh, in the future. I'm, I'm, I'm working a little bit with you through NSF on the research security stuff. But, uh, but let me tell you, it's, it, what you do is extremely important and it's valuable and it's, uh, it's getting used. But there's a lot of work to be done, as we heard. And so hang in there. Uh, keep fighting the good fight and we'll, uh, we'll all get there together. So, so thank you so much. And I hope we have, uh, have enough time for questions.
We do. I cannot thank you enough um, for sharing um, this wonderful presentation. Calvin, I'm going to read you some of the comments okay. in the chat because you've been presenting, but uh, <laughs> one of them, Diane Ambrose says, this is an excellent slide showing all that goes into the ideation and proposal submission and award. I think that goes back to one of the slides yeah, um, that slide. you had. And then another question, not a question, but a comment. Um, this is from Stephanie Scott. I'm really excited about this book. I think having a current resource is sorely needed. It will be very helpful for administrators studying to be certified research administrators, and it can serve as a great textbook for training programs. Something like this is a great resource for me where I'm a research administration educator and conduct broad outreach to faculty. Um, Susan Anderson says, inspiring. <laughs> Sean Sadler says, I'm looking forward to reading your book. And she has a question, so I'm going to oh, ask great. a question. <laughs> awesome. Um, this seems US focused. Do you address international collaborations and the administrative work that comes with multinational research efforts, such as research getting funding and or using research facilities in other countries? Do you describe the administrative work to support international research? I'm eager to hear your answer to this. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure. I have to go back and look. I, I do touch on international. I know it came up in one of the reviews uh, to the book when it was in review. Um, I don't spend a huge amount of time on it, uh, and that's something I will take. I'm, I'm making a list of stuff if there's ever a second edition improvements that I need to make. But I think it's an excellent point, and certainly, um, you know, I, I'll do a I'll do a search in the book for the word international and stuff, and you can too. Uh, but I it, it needs to be there. I do touch on it somewhat, but I don't I don't deep dive in terms of international facilities and things like that. Um, there could be an entire chapter on that, honestly. So thank you for that. That's a, I'm going to write that down. It's a really, really good point. Um, yeah. We we have some participants who have been raising their hand, but but I direct you to use the Q and A um, so that we can um, use that as the channel for moderating questions and answers. So please take a minute and do so. And in the meantime, Calvin, I'm going to take the liberty of asking you. Um, to give us a little bit more insight about the challenge that you see in um, what faculty who are involved in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research in particular face in terms of this balance between I'm doing work in this team and multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, you know, um, transdisciplinary framework, but how do I get credit for it? Because credit, you know, is it's really tricky, right? Am I getting credit? as a scholar in the field I was trained in, or do we have to do an education process with administrators who are responsible for implementing merit review and p and review? I'm just really curious about your thoughts about that particular yeah. issue. That's that's a great question, Michelle. I think I think there's sort of two dimensions to that. One is, is sort of a mechanistic dimension where, for example, you can do things, the vice chancellor for research, vice president for research can do things to incentivize that sort of collaboration, remove barriers. Uh, if there's some amount of the, the uh, F&A that is returned back uh, based upon what program you're in or whatever, they can say, okay, if, you're, if there's three different programs involved, they all three get the same equal cut, not a third, a third, a third. They can do those kinds of things. Very mechanistic. But that does also send a message of, of the value proposition. The other piece of that would be, as you say, to educate folks. The provost is really, really critical in this and the deans. Uh, to to basically saying we value this kind of scholarship in, in our tenure promotion processes. We're going to have something in there that speaks to this issue. Uh, a lot of times, my experience has been it's the the older, later career faculty who basically push back pretty hard against this stuff and are very resistant to it. So, folks who really want to see this happen need air cover from the deans and and the, the provost in particular. Um, also, one way that this happens, I think, is in interdisciplinary centers and interdisciplinary uh, institutes that sit outside of a particular academic program. And so they typically, although they, they don't they don't sort of necessarily control the credit, they're they're they typically are pretty powerful because they do bring in a lot of resources or they're they do a lot of great things. So they're 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 valued. And so they can have a, an important part of the conversation to say, you know, anybody that works in this in this center, uh, at this institute, or whatever, their department has to agree, their college has to agree to this, this, and this. So a lot of times that will give air cover back to the provost to say, hey, this is a grassroots effort now bubbling up. People want this kind of thing. 
And so we need to make it happen. We need to figure out how to make it happen. So it's not just top down and bottom. I think it's kind of all of the above and sort of meeting in the middle somewhere. So there are the mechanistic things, but they're also the uh, the messaging things, the chance of the president and so on can talk about this. But at the end of the day, it's really where the credit happens. And it comes down to incentives and rewards and promotion and tenure. Um, because, you know, some places like there's a there's a department here that if you if you uh, uh, publish a paper or whatever, it, it, it counts to nothing. So nobody would ever do that. It's like, you know, why would we do that or bring in bring in a grant? They get zero credit for that. So why would they spend all their time doing that? And so those things you just one by one have to knock them down. Uh, yes, <laughs> I can, I can <laughs> resonate with, with uh, having had You've that. Been there. All right. I have been there once or twice, exactly. Right, right. Another comment um, from Kristen Foster, fantastic presentation, and I've already downloaded to begin reading. I'm excited to share with my colleagues. Now there's another comment um, about the book that asks if there's a special code to get it for free because they were having difficulty accessing the ebook we will make sure to send information out to everybody about how to access the book uh, for anybody who may be having difficulty with that here is Here's a, a flyer i've got a flyer that's got Do the you? Code on it. Now, I, on the website it's not it says something like you know the the book and then it says something like uh ebook and you got to go into ebook you got to go into something else and something else before you actually i prefer to just say you know get the book online for free right here but you have yeah. to go through a few steps it's a little i bit, see yeah yeah, yeah. but it, it, it's there you don't need any code or, or anything like that and if you're getting that and there's a problem let me know and i'll let the press know but i, I think it works okay okay thank Students you are able to get it yeah here's another question can you speak to successful strategies when working with questions and departments to share this information to begin having these conversations at the beginning of the road for junior faculty as described in your earlier slide strategies, suggestions, how can we get that done? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I guess most of the most of the people that I've talked to um, sort of intrinsically see the value of it. Um, like here at, at the U of I, we had a, uh, a workshop for, for early career faculty. So I went and gave a presentation there and you know, downloaded everything. Um, I, I don't know if there would be much resistance to it. I would just basically go in and and I'm happy to help with this if I can just to say, OK, what are the the five or eight bullet points specifically that would be, and I guess I do talk to these in the book of specifically what, what would be the benefit. You can say, what's well, going to help you out? Okay, how's it going to help you out? Um, so I do talk about that in the book, but um, I, I haven't honestly encountered a whole lot of resistance to that. Most people who see this say, oh, God, yes. I mean, I had a lot of faculty say, I wish I had this when I was a grad student, but, but even mid-career faculty who are looking to make a change or whatever, um, is still relevant to them. And I've had a lot of mid-career faculty say, oh, I, I didn't know about this. <laughs> you know, I'd never heard of this before. I've heard had full professors say, I've never heard of uh, of, of APLU or, or FDP or AAU and stuff. I'm like, really? I mean, not that that's a bad thing necessarily. I mean, if they're heads down deep in their research, but if they did, what could it mean for them? I, I think it could mean a lot of really good things. So um, I'm not sure I... And maybe that person could reach out to me. We could have a, a, an offline conversation because I want to make sure I understand what they're asking to make sure I can be as helpful as possible. Thank you. And a, and a number of people are giving advice about how to access the book. So I think you're good. Oh, okay. That's, that's in the <laughs> Q&A, which I'll leave there for people to read. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of asking a question um, that I'm interested in particularly. And that has to do with, you know, all of the high profile cases of mis research misconduct that, you know, we hear about and have been hearing about for a little bit. Um, are there some lessons learned that we can consider that, that you've come across to developing and advancing an environment that is supportive of responsible and ethical conduct of research? In other words, is there a proactive direction we can take? We all are familiar with the regulatory approaches and the, the sort of administrative um ways to accomplish this but i just wonder what your thoughts and reflections are about you know how we can you know kind of advance a culture of adherence to these important things no that's a really really good question and and you're right i think if you speak to all the rules and regulations you know people just just tune it out and i think when you come at it from the perspective of you know how can we empower you to do your scholarship and do the right thing for the right reason in a way that is not just seen as another rule, but it's actually seen as part of your work. So you say, okay, well, you know, ethical behavior. Okay, well, 
when you're thinking about writing a proposal or a paper or whatever, you're going to be gathering information and so on. So in that process, make sure that you 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 and your students, you know, uh, have have the references lined out and things like that. And that's that's part of actually learning the the you know the, the landscape of the literature, doing an environmental scan of, of of literature and things like that. I think most people most people obviously behave in the right way, and and those who run afoul of research misconduct. Uh, some some do it just absolutely intentionally. There's just no question, and, and I don't think there's a whole lot you could really do because they're just they feel the pressures. I think another thing is is the issue of pressure. If you can say, look, we're going to create an environment that that incentivizes you doing the right things versus you feeling like you've got to skirt the rules to get ahead, you know that I think is another way to appeal to them versus just talking about about um, uh, the rules and regulations. So I think part of it is the environment in which they work. I think part of it is uh, speaking the, the the language in which they speak and then thinking the way they think about what's going to make them successful. And um, you know, you can tell people all all day long that you know one misstep in research misconduct could bring down your whole career. So I'll think, well, what what are the chances of that happening? You know, they just don't see it as as a great risk. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but I think I think approaching it from the point of view of just saying what what's right and what's wrong isn't I, I think that's a great a great suggestion and I hope people will think about that how to just integrate it into what we define as good science it has to be done ethically in order to even meet that char characteristic of course that then means we have to figure out how to manage and mitigate all that um, right yeah so well you know when not to not to prolong it but when I was at the White House and we were talking about research security I would say to somebody okay a faculty member or whatever do you do you really want somebody in your research group who would knowingly break the rules? Because a lot of times it's like, oh, this is profiling, this is you know ethnic profiling and stuff. It's like it's really not. It's about playing by the rules. And do you want somebody? Oh my gosh, of course I don't. Okay, well then, what is it you're going to do to help them learn what the rules are and know the consequences, but help bring them into the enterprise and tell them that integrity is part of doing research. That if if you if you fabricate the results on this drug you're developing or whatever, people are going to die. Are you going to do that just to get tenure? Typically, people will respond to that and say, "Oh, yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't quite get that." You know? So I think talking in that language is is a way to go. We have to model it much more than we do now. There is a comment um, from Shauna Sadler that says, "I don't see anything." She loves. She's looking through the book. She doesn't see anything about digitally persistent identifiers, um, but she thinks that that's something to add to the next book, and she's okay. happy to help. So there's information there. And I'm going to turn it over to Alex for the last word. Well, this has been amazing, Kelvin, and and I can't I can't not use this opportunity to ask something. So first, I, I went onto your onto the website, the chat on your book. I think that's such a great resource. I love it, and I put in what is the takeaway for research administrators? And it gave me a list of eight things. And one of them I think is interesting. I'm going to point it out because you're uniquely situated, right? You've been a, an academic like researcher, right? So you're a scholar, you've been a university leader, and you've been a federal official leader, um, official and a leader. And so number two, they said, the number of research compliance rules and regulations has grown dramatically over the past 30 years. And in many cases, this is many, this is coming from chat GPT in your book. Many cases, these rules are hampering research without meaningfully driving behavior in a desired direction. Administrators need to be aware of these challenges and work towards reducing researcher administrative workload, which is FDP. So yeah. from your unique perspective that we, you know, is pretty unusual. What does that mean for us as FDP? What should we be really focusing on to do this? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. It, it, through the analyses you've done, which has just been unbelievably wonderful, you know, you kind of highlight the, you know, just highlight, you really demonstrate what what the, the biggest, you know, workload issues are and things like that. Um, I think we need very specific actions, and I think we've got to, we got to bring proposals into the White House to fix this. Uh, you may know that when I was there, I created this position, um, uh, the assistant director of OSTB for academic engagement. Engagement. I brought Lisa Nichols in there. She had been on the science board. She was at Coger. She's she knows as much about this as anybody I know. And we worked really hard. We had a subcommittee on. The, we, sorry, we had a, a National Science Technology Council created a joint committee on the research enterprise. It's still there. And one of the subcommittees was on. Um, it was called. Um, uh, God committee. 
I don't know, car or something, reducing administrative workload in some way. And we got just a lot of resistance from the agencies. Um, they were they were waiting us out. And I, with all due respect to agencies, but they have a lot of stuff going, I get that. But after a while, I was about ready to say, look, if, if, if we can't get this done, we're going to do an executive order and it's going to get done. And whether you like it or not, I, I was so frustrated because some of these things are so obvious and the, the pandemic showed it. I mean, it was so demonstrably clear from the pandemic. So what FDP can do, I think, is, is help come up with some very specific actionable things that OIRA and OMB can sit down and say, OK, we could do this. We could implement this thing. And, it, you know, they just did the redid the uh, or updated the uniform guidance, you know, 2 CFR 200. And it's not too late, though, I think, to do some of these things, which could be done through administrative action of the president. They could do a, an EO. They could do a presidential memorandum of something. And the other thing I would say, and this is how FDP really works, propose an experiment. Say, we're going to take these five institutions. We've got baseline data. We want a dispensation for these particular things. And we're going to do an experiment, not in the crisis mode of a pandemic, but in the urgency of the international situation we face ourselves, we find ourselves in now because we're tying our hands. There's all this admit, there's all this intellectual energy being wasted. FDP has shown that time and again. Let's conduct an experiment with institutions to show how this can be done without any reduction of all the ethical behavior. Um, frankly, I think we've already done the experiment. I think it ought to be time to just go in and do that. But I think I think they're going to need some very very specific things. These ten things we propose you do, and just try to get it done through executive order and get already and other folks from OSTP on board with this. And I'd be happy to help with that too. But I think talking in, in more generalities, we have to reduce this and that. You guys don't do that, but I'm saying that that people people need some specific actions that you'd say, if we could do this, then the IRB workload goes down by a third or something like that. And we really start chipping away. I think we, we can't eat the elephant all at once, but I think you take the, the, the priorities that FDP has identified and come up with tangible actions that OIRA and OMB can, can take, I think that could really help move the needle. Get Coger and AAU and APLU and ACE behind you. Um, I think it could really do something. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Calvin, for this incredible presentation. Um, there's uh, We will make sure that the link gets shared with everybody so they can access the book. We appreciate your time and all of the leadership that you have shown in this space um, over so many years of your career. Um, we hope you'll be continue to stay engaged with us at the FDP and we'll, we'll look to see what's next for you on the horizon. Um, Absolutely. Happy to with, do it. With that, we are adjourned. And we reconvene at one o'clock for the federal updates. So I look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank Bye, you all. Everybody. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you so Bye -bye. Much. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.